Am I on? Yep. Okay, before I start tonight, uh, I've got a prayer request. One of my classmates in school biblical studies, Aristides Ortiz, his son was driving back to Harding, uh, I believe on Sunday evening, and fell asleep and was involved in a three-vehicle crash. Uh, he lost his arm, and I can't, let me see, I'm trying to picture him in a picture. He left, lost his left arm, cut about here. Uh, there's broken bones, and they're saying that he's going to be in the hot. He's no longer in CCU. They have moved him to a regular room, but they say that he's going to be in the hospital for six to eight weeks. Now, uh, he's a junior, so his name is Aristides Ortiz as well. So if you could keep Aristides Ortiz and his family in your prayers, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, you know, Aristides and Karina uh, got married while we were there uh, in Searcy, Arkansas, where we were living there, and, and they're just very dear to us. Uh, great friends. Aristides is a, a preacher there in Arkansas and is doing great things for the Lord. So uh, keep them in your prayers. And as the Wednesday update, hope you picked one of these up. There's tons of people to pray for. You know, uh, and there's probably more that you know of that aren't on this list. So folks, we need to be busy praying. We've got lots of people to pray for. Your, your family members need you. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. And then we'll have our public service announcement. Men, a week from tomorrow is the men's Bible study, wings, and football. Uh, John... Rezepka is going to be teaching the class. And John, have you ever taught a class here? This time, come and support John. And we're, we're going to try to have hundreds of wings. Uh, Jamie and I are testing tomorrow. And hopefully you'll enjoy what we come up with for the menu. And I noticed that he also signed up on the dessert line. So we're in for a treat. So, you know, uh, you, you got to eat. I think that was a commercial. You got to eat, so you might as well come, enjoy a good meal, a good Bible study, and good fellowship. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for blessing us so richly. We thank you for our loved ones, we thank you for our sons and daughters who are, are away at school. And we ask that you would bless their studies, that you would draw them closer to you at this time. We, we ask, Father, for those who are students here at UK and at, at the other colleges in Lexington. We ask, Father, that you would take this time, that they, they would be drawn closer to you and that they would be a light on that campus. Father, we, we just thank you for the example of Daniel, an extraordinary person with extraordinary gifts that you gave him, one who, who tried to, to bring people, one who, who served in, in the government, served his kings, and served them well. Father, in our jobs each day, help us to, to do the very best that we can and help us to glorify you. Father, we, we thank you for this evening. Help us as we open up your word. Help it to touch our hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Did I get a clicker? I don't think I did. <clears throat> They started keeping it back here.
plus one hole. Right there. Well, there might be. Yeah, they were supposed to bring it back. So I changed the first slide. Main thrust to Daniel. God rules in the affairs of men. So as we're going through this, we're going to be seeing a vision, a prophecy about a king, and whatever power this king might obtain, it would be in truth because God gave him that power. You know, think about your own opportunities, about your own resources, your own abilities, and just think of them as God's gifts. So let's go ahead and, and get into Daniel chapter 8. And we're basically, we're going to read through the first 14 verses, which is the vision itself. In the third year of king, in the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ule Canal. So this is the third year of King Belshazzar. It's about 551, 550 B.C. And it's King Belshazzar. Does anybody remember who King Belshazzar is? Or you could call him a co-regent. Was he Babylonian? Was he Medo-Persian? Was he Greek? Anybody remember? Does anybody remember a story that he was in or a narrative that he was in earlier couple chapters back. He's Babylonian. He was in the last Babylonian uh, period where he, and I believe it was either his uh, uncle, no, be brother or his father, depending on which way you go. Do you believe the historians? Do you believe the Bible? Uh, served as the other regent. And he was in Susa, which is about 200 miles east of Babylon. So let's look a little bit at the Babylonian Empire. So first we have uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, 605 to 563 B.C., and that seems to be when it's at its very... Uh, peak of its power from 563 to 561 BC there's evil Merodach he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar and he was assassinated by Neraglisser who was a brother-in-law to Nebuchadnezzar and Neraglisser actually got to die of natural causes but this sounds like it was a very dangerous family to be a part of uh, then there was Labashi Marduk, who was son of Neraglisser. He was killed during a revolt by the followers of Nabonidus, uh, who, served, who was uh, king from 556 to 539 B.C. He was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And Belshazzar, who was co-regent with Nabonidus. And the Bible says that he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the historians say that he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. So that's a little bit about the Babylonian Empire. If you take a look at the map, I hope it's better. That's basically where that gold is. That's how big the Babylonian Empire was. And I wish I had one that had the, the countries laid out on it. Uh, this just happens to be topography. <clears throat> I 
I raised my eyes and saw and beheld a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging west, westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue, him, rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. And usually when one gets to the king of the hill, they do what they want. And vanity takes over. And sometimes they're great in their own eyes. Sometimes they're great in the eyes of others. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down and trampled on him. There was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. Out of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great, even to the host of heaven, and some of the hosts and some of the stars that threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown, and the host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Now, when it talks about the regular burnt offering, it's talking about the daily burnt offering in the temple in Jerusalem. So, how many offerings were, were included in the daily offering? Anybody know what was included? If you go to Numbers chapter 28, let's go ahead and go to Numbers 28. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 3. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed. Wait a minute. I'm in Deuteronomy. Sorry. I meant numbers. Okay. I think that sounded right. Twenty-eight, uh, three through eight. And you shall say to them, "This is the food offering that you shall offer to the Lord: two man, male lambs, a year old, without blemish, day by day, as a regular offering. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight." So there were two lambs each day. So it's talking about the regular offering. And it's done because of transgression. Now is it the transgression of the conquering army, the conquering king? Is it the transgression of, of Judah? Yeah, their own transgression. So this is punishment for their own transgression, for following after idols and for drifting away from God. Okay. 
Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For twenty-three evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Now basically, uh, some of you may have heard of the Maccabees, the Maccabees. And that was a time of uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. He basically was the Seleucid general, uh, Syria. Basically everything to Egypt was under his control. Palestine, Judah was under his control. And uh, he was basically... Uh, He, he was just not a nice guy. Let's put it that way. He, he was an evil man. And he was like a big kid with a, with a ball who's playing in a game and things aren't going his way. And when it doesn't, he says, picks up his ball and he just goes home. But that's not the way he did it. If he picked up his ball, you were going to be hurt. A very violent person. So he went to Egypt. He was going to conquer Egypt. The Roman army stopped him. Upset him. So he took out his violence like a bully upon Jerusalem. Basically took away the regular offering. He took away the right of circumcision. He tried to, uh, he put Zeus into the temple and tried to force the Jews to worship Zeus. Now, some of the Jews embraced the Hellenization, the, the, the Greek customs. Others didn't want anything to do with it. And within those others were the Maccabees. And they went to war against Antiochus Epiphanes. And this would be about the, the middle of the second century BC. And out of that group, of the Maccabees, there was a group that joined them in the fighting called the Hasidim. Has anybody here read the book Chosen, The Chosen by uh, Chaim Podok? You didn't have to read it in middle school? I had to read it in middle school. And The Chosen is uh, about a time period of the 1960s, uh, 1950s, in the Williamsburg Heights, uh, borough of Brooklyn, and there, and the Hasidim still live there in Brooklyn today. So a sect that began way back in the second century BC is still living among us in the United States today, a Jewish sect. And out of the Hasidim came the Pharisees. And they were a group that were around during Jesus' time. So, you know, Antioch Epiphanes was a pretty terrible guy. And that's pretty much what this is about. And I think I've already started talking about what is two or three slides down the way. <clears throat> so what the Jews can know from this vision, and this vision is all about the near future, What's going to happen to the Jews? They've been carted off. They're in Babylon. Some of them have been uh, able to go home. And, but what they know about their new future is that it's going to be a time of conflict and conquest. It's going to be a time of political turmoil. You know, think about the political turmoil that we have here in the United States. It was going to be far worse for them. It was going to be a time of persecution, but that persecution was going to be followed by a time of restoration. So now the interpretation, and I always like it when the Bible interprets itself. Back in chapter 7, I was lost. I'm a historian. I like to talk about history. And prophecy is not my strength. 
So when the Bible gives an interpretation, I run with it. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. Now where else have we seen Gabriel in the Bible? I think there's only one other place. Well, out of, outside of Daniel. Luke chapter 1. What's happening in Luke chapter 1? Okay. And Joseph is being told not to put Mary away. And I think Gabriel was the one involved in both of those. And that's found in Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 11 through 20, and also verses 26 through 39. So Gabriel's a messenger here, well, a messenger there, but here, Gabriel is an interpreter of the vision. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. So what is meant by the appointed time of the end? Okay. And some other folks will take that. To mean. And the example. Uh, when Judas Maccabees purified the temple and rededicated it. And I think that was like 168. No, 165 B.C. So, but some other people will, as judgment day, you know, which I definitely did more as the intelligence and then the Greek. Fifth. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, personally. So, though that doesn't mean that it could do prophecy, because we've seen that in the Bible before as well. Bart over here has got a quizzical look. Smiling. <clears throat> Verse 20. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in place, of which four others arose, for kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. So here's the Persian Empire. If you can remember the Babylonian Empire, this is much larger. This goes a little bit into Egypt. It goes into Europe and goes farther into Asia. So here's a timeline for the Medo-Persian Empire. And I didn't put the dates, but this is basically 
a list of those who ruled. You had Darius the Mede, Cyrus king of Persia. You had Cambyses, who was son of Cyrus. Darius the Persian. Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, son of Darius, and he was the husband of Esther. Artaxerxes, who was son of Xerxes. And then Darius three. And he was the one to lose the empire to the Greeks, to Alexander the Great. So here's the Grecian Empire. Lasted almost 190 years, almost two centuries. And it's even much larger still. Goes much further into Europe, a little further into Egypt. Uh, you had the Romans there in Egypt, so it was very difficult to, to make any inroads there. And then further into Asia as well. So when he was asked who should succeed him, Alexander the Great said the strongest. So this basically led to his empire, and we, we saw where the horn was split into the four. Well, it was split between four of his generals, Cassander, Ptolemy. Ptolemy was given Egypt, Antigonus, and Seleucus, known as the, and this is my guess, the Diatic Key, or successors. Ptolemy reigned in Egypt and ruled Judah until the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, and he basically came in and drove uh, the successor of Ptolemy out in 168 B.C. So a lot of history. But to me, if you can put it on a hook of history, prophecy makes a lot more sense. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. God gives him that power. God puts him in his place. And he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many. He shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. So this is about the middle of the 6th century, and it's talking about something that's going to happen in the middle of the 2nd century. It's almost 400 years before. And he's telling them to, to seal it up. It's going to be a long time before this happens. So Antiochus Epiphanes, he was king of the Seleucid Empire from about 175 B.C. until 164 B.C. Uh, he's famous for almost conquering Egypt and for his brutal persecution of the Jews. And this is what's pre precipitated the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, there's first, and I think there's second Maccabees that talk about that. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was a ruthless and often capricious ruler, and he is properly titled Antiochus IV, but he took upon himself the title Epiphanes, which means illustrious one or God manifest. So he took upon himself being a deity. However, his bizarre and blasphemous behavior earned him another nickname among the Jews, which was Epiphanes, which means the mad one. So basically, this whole prophecy leads up. And if, if you know, if you read anything about Antiochus Epiphanes and you read this prophecy, it's almost like you're seeing a word portrait of the man. And here's Daniel's reaction. 
And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. So here's an important principle from that last verse. Daniel was appalled by what he saw in the vision. But he didn't lay in his bed and moan and groan about it. He didn't let it uh, force him to, to set aside his duties. He didn't shrink from his duties. He returned to the duties that God had called him to, and he didn't retire from the world. He knew that evil days were coming. He knew that, that there was going to be conflict and conquest. He knew that there was going to be persecution. He knew that there was going to be political turmoil but he didn't shrink away from it. It didn't force him to, to become a, uh, what's that when a person goes out and uh, becomes by themselves? There were a sect of monks that did that. Uh, but he didn't retire from the world. He, he continued to live in the present, to be engaged in the present, even when he knew that the future was going to be horrible. So basically, in view of what the future holds, we must live holy lives now. You know, folks, sometimes the future looks pretty bleak. You know? And sometimes that's because we can only see today, the present, the present situation. We don't know what God has in store for us. And it looks pretty bleak. But we still have to continue living Christ-like lives. That's the lesson of this chapter. You know, even, even when things look their worst. You know, I told you about my friend Aristides Ortiz. His son, arm cut off. Horrible auto accident in the CCU. Been moved to a regular room. Now he can have as many visitors as he wants. And every one of them that comes into his room, he, he initiates prayer. He's the one that initiates prayer. He's not allowing something horrible to change the fact that he's going to live holy because God is holy. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book back in 1955. Uh, I read it when I was in my probably late 20s. And I've read it once since then. It was called, How Should We Then Live? Francis Schaeffer, if you want a, a really good uh, Christian criticism of current culture, of art, uh, you know, work, just culture, and uh, he's one to read. And uh, in that t time, you know, 1955, we consider that to be the golden period. Boy, I wish it was still in the 1950s. We could let our kids ride their bike to the park, and they felt safe, and, you know, the kids could run all around town, and everybody looked out for everybody else's kids. But he looked out, and he saw moral decay. He saw America entering onto a slippery slope and starting its way down. So he wrote, he asked the question, basically, how should we then live and wrote a book about it? And in this book, he, well, let me ask you the question. We're facing moral decay. We're seeing what was right now being redefined as what is wrong. We're seeing what is wrong now being redefined as what is right. So we're, we're facing moral decay. How should we then live? Should we become a prepper? Dig a hole in the ground? 
put one of those houses in the ground, store a bunch of canned goods and water and, and just wait for the end to happen. Say, I'm prepared. Is that what we should do? Should we shrink from the world? How should we then live? Okay, more time in the book, more times with our, our brothers and sisters, more time telling the good news of Jesus Christ. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're facing moral decay. Probably worse than what Francis Schaeffer was facing in 1955, though you hate to compare periods, time periods. So how should we then live? John Wesley was going to a preaching engagement and somebody stopped him and they were, they were trying to be the uh, facetious and trying to, to get under John's skin and they said, you know, what if Jesus were coming tomorrow at noon? What would you do between now and then? And John took out his appointment book, which was filled with preaching and teaching engagements and looked at it, and then handed it to the man. He said, I do that. He wasn't going to change a thing. We need to be prepared. Jesus could come again at any time. And if we're prepared, if we know that he's coming tomorrow at noon, we're not going to change our lives whatsoever. Now, we, we still need to be light on a hill, we still need to be salt. We still need to be like leaven. You know, think about the mustard seed. You know, we might have make a small effort, but that small effort might grow into something much bigger. Well, here's what Francis Schaeffer said. We need to live by the Christian ethic. We still need to define right and wrong by what's in the book. We need to accept God's word as his revealed word. And we need to affirm the biblical morals, values, and meanings to our neighbors, our co-workers, everyone that we meet. You know, you said, well, how can God use me? How can I be light? How can I be salt? Well, God has always used unlikely characters to accomplish his purpose. He can use anybody. He can accomplish his purpose through any and all people, even those who pose him. Think about Pharaoh. You know, he said, who is this God that tells me to let Israel go? He spoke out against Yahweh, Pontius Pilate, even those who are hesitant. Now, how many excuses did Moses give when God was there at the burning bush telling him, you know, you got you to gotta lead the people out of Egypt. And he gave excuse after excuse. Jeremiah, you know, I'm too young to preach after God told him to go preach. John Mark, who, who left one of the missionary journeys and, and basically left such a, a taste in Paul's mouth that when he wanted to go again, Paul said, no way, we're not taking him again. And he and Barnabas split and two areas were evangelized instead of one. Even those who are hesitant, God can use. Even those who oppose them. 
God is able to accomplish His purpose through any and all people, even those who are imperfect. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you know, they deceived people. They were guilty of deception. You know, Isaiah, when he came into the presence of the Holy One, he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. So he can use sinners to accomplish his purpose. He's able to accomplish his purpose through even those we don't expect. Go back to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel has been told to, to go and see Jesse and take a look at his sons and that one of those is going to be the future king. And he goes and he looks at this one and he's tall. And I, and I don't remember all the names. Uh, he's tall and he's handsome. And he's strong. And he says, surely this one's going to be the king. And he keeps, God keeps saying, nope, not that one. Keeps going down the line. And finally he looks back and he says, is there any more? Oh yeah, there's David out there taking care of the sheep. Send for David. David comes and God says, that's the one. The 12 apostles. You look at them and you look at their stories and you say, man, what a motley crew. And God was able to use them to, to spread the gospel throughout Asia and into Europe and Africa. Even Jesus. Let's go to Isaiah 53. Well, sorry folks, we almost made it to the end. Thank you very much for your participation. Chapter 9 next week has some very difficult prophecies, some that are used by the premillennialist. Uh, it'll be an interesting discussion next week. I look forward to that class. Thank you for coming.